yourself, Tim. You have Lachlan. Howdy. And Ruben. G'day. So, guys, um, how's your week been? Too bad. I had a bit of excitement. Yes. Had a uh, had a cyst cut out of the back of my leg. That was a bit of fun. Whoa. Damn, dude. Wow. Well, um, I suppose I suppose that's excitement. Yeah. Well, it wasn't really sort of a big deal. It's nothing wrong. Like it's just benign and all that sort of thing. But it's about the size of a big marble not 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 the small normal marble but the sort the of con- conkers yeah the, the bigger one and it's sort of on there from pre-covid and uh just hadn't sort of gotten around to getting it sorted finally got around to getting it sorted and uh yeah anyway just uh went to get it checked out he said oh just hop on the table we'll just cut it out now so uh <laughs> oh, did he use an oxy or what did he use yeah, he was, he's <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was the scalpel. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyway, it was pretty funny. I came back to work afterwards and uh, I was just working from home on the day and uh, I was just jumping on a call. I sort of feel something look down as a pool of blood on the Ooh. floor under my desk chair. And uh, it seems like I hadn't uh, it got a blood vessel or something and uh, hadn't quite sealed it off. So uh was just sitting there just... Uh, weeping onto the floor so I had to go back and get another stitch put in it so <laughs> nice oh shit yeah. anyway it was a bit of fun I'll send you guys a picture later so you can uh, have a laugh at the gore <laughs> <laughs> very nice well mm. I, I, I did not go and get something cut out I went and had an x-ray and an ultrasound because um, I've had uh, a pain in my right rib and the uh, doctor thinks I might have a fracture so I'll find out tomorrow what that goes with that one. But um, yeah, how's your body, Ruben? Have you had anything you've had to get sorted out? This bloody middle age thing sucks. <laughs> well, I was about to say, is this a podcast for, for middle aged men, or is this for, for you know old blokes? Are we, are we going to start talking about my prostate next? <laughs> well, for for old men, I think it's which specialist did you get to acquire this week, as opposed to just things going wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm all right. Yeah. yeah. Very nice, very nice. Well, um, let's switch to the topic of choice, which is our drinks. Uh, sure. I am drinking Ardberg, which is oh, a, a uh, the ultimate Islay single malt whiskey, scotch whiskey. It's the peatiest. Peatiest of all whiskeys. It is very peaty and it is 10 years old and it is delicious. And what are you drinking yeah, there, that's Lachlan? A good one. Um, I'm keeping it classy by having the uh, Daniels of the Jack. Mm. So. <laughs> well, at least it's not gin. I haven't had bourbon for ages, but uh, it's, uh, I'm quite enjoying it, actually. It's been a while. Very You've got good. mixed with a bit of Coke, Coke there, isn't yeah. it? Of course. you got to, got to keep it like you're uh, 18, 19, right? So. Uh, yeah, gee, it's been a while for that. <laughs> Yeah, kind of. I can't remember the last time I put uh, anything in my spirits other than ice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh come on! Isn't isn't gin technically a spirit? Yeah, all right. If you call gin a spirit, then fair call. <laughs> and what are you drinking there, Ruben? Oh, I've got uh, Peronis. It's just oh, a beer. Yeah. Someone good. left it in my fridge. <laughs> <laughs> we did. It was uh, my son's birthday. So I'm now the parent of a teenager. Good God. I know. What has happened? It sounds terrifying. Yes. But uh, <laughs> we had we went and hung out at Ruben's place and uh, I cooked burgers for the kids because that's what my son wanted. Mm-hmm. And then we ordered some food called Black Bear, which is like uh, American style barbecue. And that was good. It was very good. Oh, that was good, Tucker. Yeah. Mm. So that went well. Awesome. Yes. Anyway, well, let's uh, let's jump in to our book. So, um, the Enchiridion. Uh, we are up to section thirty-two. So uh, I'll do my best to read this without making too many mistakes, <laughs> and uh, we'll keep going from there. Here we go. When you make use of prophecy, 
Remember that while you know not what the issue will be, but are come to learn it from the prophet, you do know before you come what manner of thing it is, if you are really a philosopher. For if the event is not in our control, it cannot be either good or evil. Therefore, do not bring with you to the prophet the will to get or the will to avoid, and do not approach him with trembling, but with your mind made up that the whole issue is indifferent and does not affect you, and that whatever it be, it will be in your power to make good use of it, and no one shall hinder this. With confidence then, approach the gods as counsellors, and further, when the counsel is given you, remember whose counsel it is, in whom you will be disregarding if you disobey. And consult the oracle as Socrates thought men should, only when the whole question turns upon the issue of events, and neither reason nor any art of man provides opportunities for discovering what lies before you. Therefore, when it is your duty to risk your life with friend or country, do not ask the oracle whether you should risk your life. For if the prophet warns you that the sacrifice is unfavorable, though it is plain that this means death or exile or injury to some part of your body. Yet reason requires that even at this cost you must stand by your friend and share your country's danger. Wherefore pay heed to the greater prophet, Pythian Apollo, who cast out of his temple the man who did not help his friend when he was being killed. Lots in that one. Lots in that one. It's pretty interesting um, to talk about, really, because like prophecy is not really a thing in the modern age. I mean, I'm sure people still go to a fortune teller, right? But it's <clears throat> it's not a, a mainstream um, sort of thing. Oh, unless you kind of put it in the context of, I guess you're uh, going to church to talk to God, if you know what I mean. Mm. And this is the equivalent, I suppose, this sort of thing. Maybe. I mean, you're right. I think part of the reason, like, as you guys know, I love that recent movie, The Northman. Mm. And, um, you know, spoiler alert for those who have not seen it, um, there are sections in there where things are prophesized. And, and so it gives the main character confidence, like, this is not where I will die because this is going to happen, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and you know, part, I think part of the reason why that movie didn't flop but it didn't do amazing is I think a lot of people aren't really used to those ideas and aren't used to the religious story that it portrayed. Oh, I and mean, you've seen it, Ruben. Did, what do you think? Am I onto something? No, you might be, actually. That's, I didn't have thought of that. That's interesting. Yeah, I wonder, are people not comfortable with this idea of prophecy anymore? Yeah, it's certainly not something I can recall ever really hearing about in the modern age um other than you know fortune tellers but i mean they don't claim a uh kinship with the gods as it as it were um <laughs> so um it's, it's a bit of a different thing but i don't know i guess like my um you know when i think of this sort of stuff i'm thinking back to stuff like assassin's creed odyssey again you know because that they, they they do have the uh pythia and uh um, some some oracles featuring there and, and stuff like you know even three hundred right yeah it's like in the mind for me too yeah um, but you know along with that though I'm instantly thinking of like perversion of that by man because you know, I think in all of those examples they're they're basically being twisted to uh, push some political agenda so. Yeah, anyway, so I feel a bit tainted on the idea of, uh, of prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm pretty open to it. Exposure. Yeah, I, I'm pretty open to it, I think, because, like, you're right, like, in church they do, like, you got the prophets and mm. uh, a lot of what um, ministers preach about, you know, Christ is that he fulfilled a lot of prophecies and a lot of things that were sort of foretold. Um, so that it's not as foreign to me in mm. that way. I, I think it's interesting when I when I first read this reading where it goes when you make use of prophecy I think I read that initially as when you try and do it yourself <laughs> but then as I kept reading I was like oh no he's talking about when you go and see someone who does prophecy so yeah and later on he 
And later on, he makes reference to it that um, when when you get a when you're getting a prophecy that way, it's considered to be like what the gods are telling you. Like it's they did. It, it seems like when they were talking about getting prophecies, they meant you were supposed to take it as if it was like an order from the gods or whatever. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, which is interesting. He um, uh, it, it seems to be sort of like trying to dispel some advice as well, just around you know like why are you going there? Because um, again, if you're just asking for like to get something, you know, that's not really what it should be about. Um, you know, it should be about something sort of a bigger issue, I guess. Um, maybe not even a personal one. Um, you know, there's that whole part about, you know, um, not trying to sort of seek out what you can't, what's outside of your control. So just have that yeah, in mind. Yeah, he does. He says that, doesn't he? <laughs> Yeah. He's like, therefore, when it's your duty to risk your life with friend or country, do not ask the Oracle whether you should risk your life. He's basically like, a, I guess a simple way of saying that is, if you know what your duty is, what good is it knowing what the outcome is going to be? Because you've got to go do yeah. it. All, all the prophecy could potentially do is make you less likely to carry out your duty. So I guess he's kind of putting that idea of duty above um, the idea of prophecy, because like you, like you said, Lachlan, um, the prophecy can only really be self-serving in that situation. Yeah, I think like the, the concept's really interesting because, I mean, it must be really in those times when it seems like, you know, you'd have people queuing up to go, you know, see the Oracle or whatever it may well be. And um, it must have been really tempting to try and get a glimpse into, into your future. Um, so maybe in a way this is kind of like a warning for temptation, you know what I mean? Like, um, try and try and resist that a little bit because if you if the information that it gives you is not going to change what you have to do why ask for it you know yeah yeah i think which uh, it kind of makes i think that makes a bit of sense hmm. he's also moving away from like doing it out of fear you know he's saying like with confidence approach the god as counselors which i thought is pretty interesting you know it's basically saying like treat them as advisors almost you know um <clears> yeah well is, is he there mindset yeah is he there saying if you don't know what to do go and get go and get go to the oracle that's all good and well because you know it might give you guidance but i think that's then why in the second is that then why in the second half he goes but if you know what your duty is don't go just do mm. your duty yeah yeah, it might be like something a bit, you know, like if you're a leader or something and you you like got some conflict going on with another country and it's like, you know, you might be saying, well, you know, what what should I do for our country or something like the bigger issue rather than just your own personal whatever, you know, should I? Yeah, um, like use them, use them for guidance on what, what is right to do. But if you already know what is right to do, then you don't need mm -hmm. their guidance. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. <clears throat> what do you think he means, though, um, the bit where he goes, for if the event is not in your control, it cannot be good or evil? Do you think he's talking about, like, in the same way that he talks about if something is in alignment with nature? Like, so, basically, because that's his definition, right? Is if it's in accordance with nature, it's out of your control. Hmm. We, we've had, there's certainly been something mentioned um, in another passage we'd read, which is talking about a similar thing, Rubes. I can't quite that, remember. Oh, that bit, it was that really <clears throat> short one, wasn't it? Um, uh, as as it, a yeah. mark is not set up for men. Yeah, 27. To miss it. So there is nothing intrinsically evil in the world. So I don't know. I just, I read that bit. In the uh, in this in this latest one we're doing right now, where he says, uh, "If an event is not in your our control, uh, it cannot be good or evil." I just he must have some like a different concept of good and evil than what we do. I just I don't really understand exactly what it is. Do you think he oh. perceives that good and evil is only something that man causes? Because it seems to be when he talks about things that are in nature or of the gods or out of your own control it's not good or evil or is he or is it more just it's not worth worrying about 
or to treat it. I think it, the only way I can, the only normal. way I can, the only way I can sort of make it make sense. And I don't know whether this is, whether this is right or not, but his whole thing is, um, you know, you only, you can only really control essentially what you, how you react to things and your emotions and so, and so on and so forth. So, um, if good and evil is a matter of choice, those are the only things you can choose. Therefore, anything outside of your control can't be a decision for good or evil because it's not your decision. Yeah. But, uh, I think it's too, there's something that he's previously sort of said about, like, if you get some you know, information or something like that, then it's up to you to be able to use that for, for your own benefit, your own good. Um, so like in some sense, it doesn't matter what the news is. The fact that you have that news means you can do something with it. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Whatever it be, it will be in your power to make good use of it. Hmm. So good or evil for him comes down to how you react to things and what you do with the, what you're given. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's even that like whole thing with the fates, you know, even if you have a, a tough fate or an easy fate or whatever, you can still make that good or bad depending on the decisions that you make. Um, so I think it's in that same sort of ilk, maybe. I feel like it's their attempt to answer the conflict between predestination and free will. It's mm. like, um, oh, kind of like you're saying, saying, kind of like you're saying, your predest, your circumstances are predestined, but free will exists in how you react to it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. That way they both exist. Well, you might still have a, a tough life, but you can still live it in a moral fashion and, well, in, in their understanding, have a, uh, you may have a better next life, you know what I mean? Because yeah. you, because of the morality you've lived through this one. This is an uh, idea that um, I've been learning through my personal trainer. They've been doing this, um, I'll do a plug for them. They've been doing this masterclass thing this is their book it's um fitness fanatics and um there's a thing they said in that one of the group chats that they did which it really stuck with me um it's about how to change your mind from negative to positive and it's just a simple word change so in the morning like because i wake up it's so blooming early it's like five o'clock in the morning when i start work so it's like four <laughs> It's like, oh, I have to get up in the morning um, and I have to go to work and I have to do this. And they're like, just change the word have to get and watch what happens. And it's so right. Like, I get to go to work. I get to wake up. I get to get up early. And just by changing that one word, it's like the same event is happening to me, but now I'm framing it in a way that's positive rather than negative. And it just changes sitting- how you feel about the day. Are you setting your attitude to gratitude, bro? Correct. <laughs> <laughs> By just changing a single word, like a single word, it's amazing. Um, so I think that's yeah, right. what they're getting at is a similar idea. Of, of mm. it's, it's your response to the event that determines whether or not it's good or bad. Yeah, I, I think, think so. You think that's right? Yep. Yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah, nice. This okay. next one's a beast, Tim. Yeah, it's quite it's long. Raw long. Before I read it, I... I'll, I'll pause the recording so I can clear my throat and blow my nose, and then we'll uh, keep going. Oh, good. And we're back. Okay, so uh, this one is a big one. It's uh, section 33. Uh, so I'm going to read probably a paragraph or two paragraphs at a time. Pause. We'll discuss and then keep going. So. 33a we'll call it lay down for yourself from the first a definite stamp and style of conduct which you will maintain when you are alone and also in the society of men be silent for the most part or if you speak say only what is necessary and in a few words talk but rarely if occasion calls you but do not talk of ordinary things of gladiators or horse races or athletes or of meats or drinks These are topics that arise everywhere. But above all, do not talk about men in blame or compliment or comparison. If you can, turn the conversation of your company by your talk to some fitting subject. 
but if you should chance to be isolated among strangers, be silent. Do not laugh much, nor at many things, nor without restraint. Interesting. Oh yeah, I just had a thought. Um, I hope this doesn't derail us, but um, no, no. Like that first sentence, lay down for yourself from first a definite stamp and style of conduct which you will maintain by yourself mm-hmm. and with others. Because um, this section goes on for a while in paragraphs. Is is what comes after this basically dot point? He's saying this is the this is the definite stamp and style that you should of conduct you should set out. Is that the way it's set up? I think so. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Cool. Uh, that just just occurred to me. Now. I don't know why it didn't occur to me the first time around. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so is, like he's kicking off and just saying, well, let's let's establish your own moral standard and keep that standard whether you're on your own or with somebody else. Um, and then he's going to... And now he'll give, he'll give you that standard. <laughs> yeah, that, and then, yeah, here, here's the points you should follow, right? Or some of them at least anyway. Yeah. Um, so what do you reckon? Be silent for the most part. And uh, right. if you're going to have a conversation, talk about something worthwhile, that's pretty much what he's saying, isn't it? Yeah. Which like, uh, do you know, that sort of makes some sense to me. Like I'm not a, a huge conversationalist unless we're talking about cars or something. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so I, I don't know. Cause I, I, and I say that because I'm like not into sport and stuff like that, which is just like a typical thing. Like when a bunch of like people get together, you know, they're talking about the gladiators here you know, or whatever else. And I don't know, like I don't participate in that. And uh, it's not because I'm uh, taking moral high ground, I might add. It's just because I don't really uh, watch it or understand it. But <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think he's just saying, yeah, if, if, like save your conversation for something meaningful. And uh, if everyone else is just chit-chatting about social niceties and there's not really um, anything to add, I suppose it puts you a bit cold in the uh, company of others though, right? <laughs> well, it just makes you that yeah. silent guy, which I quite often am at uh, a lot of extended family things. I quite often just sit outside the circle slightly and just observe and, you know, there's that, uh, is it, um, oh, who said it? There was that statement about like, um, the three levels of conversation. Just let me find it. Hang on. Well, I yeah, don't think the, you. You got ribs. Um. I. Oh, yeah, he goes on to say, "Do not laugh much, nor at many things, nor without restraint." It's kind of basically just good general advice. Like if you're amongst strangers. Don't make an ass of yourself is more or less what he's saying. Yeah, pretty much. Reserve, you know, reserve your judgment and, you know, participate if you can, but uh, if you're sort of there by yourself, just you know, chill. <laughs> so the quote yeah. I was thinking of is, um, uh, it's attributed to Eleanor Roosevelt. So, um, great minds discuss ideas, average minds discuss events, small minds discuss people. And so, oh yeah, yeah, that fits this. Yeah, so I often over the last I don't know eighteen months maybe, I'll, when I'm at a social events and this is at work and everywhere else too, if people are discussing people, I just completely switch off. <laughs> I just don't even want to listen to that conversation anymore. And events exactly I'll sort what... of listen in on and go, eh, okay, maybe participate a little bit. Like people talk about COVID and all those things yeah maybe a little bit but when it gets to ideas I'm like yeah I'm in let's have a chat about that and um, it's funny how that's changed because a few years ago I was big into talking about sports and all that sort of stuff and now it's like yeah <laughs> well that's um, yeah that's basically what his, his advice is but above all do not talk about men in blame or compliment or in comparison which you could summarize that by saying don't gossip mm-hmm. yeah totally. it's kind of yeah. like the lowest to him, he's basically, like you say, it's the lowest form of, uh, you know, chit chat 
or like what you said with that quote, Tim, that's disgusting people. Exactly, yeah. Sorry to take this uh, lowbrow for a second, but when you said that quote by Eleanor Roosevelt, I couldn't help but think of the uh, start of the movie, uh, The Ballad of Ricky Bobby, Talladega Nights. Because they've, <laughs> their, uh, they've got a misquote by Eleanor Roosevelt in there, saying something oh, like, uh, uh, America is all about speed. Hot, dirty, nasty speed. <laughs> Yeah, that is good. (laughs) Yeah, nice. All right, well, let's continue. Um, I'll read the next two. Sure. Uh, Just do the next one. It's short, but it's sort of... Just do the next one. I reckon just go for it one at a time. All right, done. Refuse to take oaths altogether if that be possible but if not, as far as circumstances allow. Now, I will say, this is a biblical idea too. This is very big in the Bible about let your yes be yes and your no be no and don't take others and don't swear to things. It's just keep it simple. I see. I was curious if that's what the sort of meaning was or if they were just talking about oaths as in like like swearing and, uh, you know, because people would call that an oath, you know what I mean? Like, by Odin's beard, or whatever it was that. Uh... <laughs> well, that's the same thing, basically. Mm. Yeah. Because no, okay. when, when yeah. you say, by, by Odin's beard, I will do X, or by yeah. Odin's beard, X happens, that's kind of like an oath. Yeah, sure, sure. I think that's really good advice because uh, I, think, I think they would agree with this. You're tempting fate when you say, I'm definitely going to do this thing because there's so many things outside of your control that could stop that from uh, happening. Yeah. So if you believe in fate, hey. Well, yeah, but I think you can just say I intend to do this. <laughs> yeah. I think that's about yeah. as far as you can commit without being arrogant. Sure. Mm. Yeah, you're right. It ties totally into mm. his whole ethos, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah. And, and even sometimes my kids will ask me if I, I'll say, oh, we'll, we'll try and do this thing and they'll go like, do you promise? And I'll be like, well, I, that's my intention. No. It's my intention <laughs> to do that thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very cautious about making promises with my kids actually. Yeah. Now that you mention it. Yeah. Maybe that's something that comes with like wisdom of parenting. I have a feeling because, <laughs> you know, there's sometimes when you, you, you fail to deliver on something when you have full intentions of doing something and just for whatever reason, it just can't happen. And, um, yeah, if you've promised, oh, it's a yeah. bad day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just not on. Yeah. Um, I did make O's when I got married, that's for sure. Um, but I, I can't recall too many others outside of that. Hmm. All right, well, that's good. Um, let's do the next one. Um, yep. Refuse the entertainments of strangers and the vulgar, but if occasion arise to accept them, then strain every nerve to avoid lapsing into the state of the vulgar. For know that if your comrade have a stain on him, he that associates with him must need share the stain, even though he be clean in himself. Hmm. Let's uh, don't uh, get dragged into tawdry conversations. Um, and if the company you're keeping is, uh, I don't know, s- speaking of vulgar matters, then um, abstain and keep out of it. But beware if you're uh, participating in an event with others who are indulging in it. You may get painted with the same brush whether you're uh, participating or not, maybe. Yeah. yeah, I think that's roughly what he's saying. Just avoid bad company, really. Mm. Or vulgar. Good word. I have to start trying to use that a little bit more. Vulgar, yes. Vulgar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll say that next time someone's saying something inappropriate. Like, that is vulgar humour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Hark. It feels like it belongs in the Lighthouse movie, River. <laughs> Hark! <laughs> <laughs> Still haven't watched it. Oh, dude. <laughs> so much Wayne I mean, in that movie. It's crazy. I mean, yeah. yeah. 
All right, let's do the next one. Uh, for your body, take just so much as your bare need requires, such as food, drink, clothing, house, servants, but cut down all that tends to luxury and outward show. Interesting how I read that as all of us are like sipping our drinks. Yeah. <laughs> well, Rubes and I were having a bit of a discussion um, pre-chat before you were, uh, you were on, Tim. And um, this just makes me think of this like, perfectly um i was just reading somebody talking about the incaridian and um what and i suppose epictetus um just that his writings are kind of like glorifying socrates and um not for any like bad reasons or anything like that but i think he just thought he's a solid dude and he was a good example of you know um the the philosophic sort of way of living and um that maybe the incaridians it's almost just like the, the lessons on how to be more like Socrates. So when I read that, yeah. that one, it just sounds like out of the Republic again, like how he's trying to set the standard, I think, for how people should live, which is just with enough, without sort of luxury and excess, just have enough, don't be greedy, and you'll have a comfortable way of life. Yeah, I just can't see any yeah. mention of wearing Crocs. <laughs> Socrates would have worn Crocs for sure. <laughs> he would have got it from Salvos too. He would have got some totally. from the Salvos. Yep. yep. <laughs> for people that don't know what the Sal, oh, everyone knows what the Salvation Army is, don't they? Like internationally, it's a charity second-hand goods shop. Yeah, right. I think that'd be a way to describe it. I don't think they have that in the States. Definitely from uh, from from Britain and uh, Australia and British colonies, perhaps. But yeah. From the Commonwealth. Those are That's the it. Commonwealth. The Commonwealth, mate. That's it. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I had the same thought when I read this bit. I'm like, oh, yeah, he's describing Socrates in his shoeless, mooching ways. <laughs> well, you know, I just think about that when he was first describing how the, uh, how people would live in the perfect city when they were describing yeah. that after, I can't remember, it might've been Glaucon came along later and said, oh, you know, but people want a few luxuries, you know, let, let's not be too harsh here, Socrates. <laughs> yeah. He's such a deviant, it. that Glaucon. Oh, he's dodgy ass. <laughs> dodgy ass. All right. Um, next one. Avoid impurity to the utmost of your power before marriage. And if you indulge your passion, let it be done lawfully. But do not be offensive or censorious to those who indulge it. And do not be always bringing up your own chastity. If someone tells you that so and so speaks ill of you, do not defend yourself against what he says. But answer, he did not know my other faults or he would not have mentioned these alone. <laughs> Oi, before we hook into this what is he talking about if you indulge your passion, passions let it be done lawfully <laughs> what, what, what is don't, don't know about? hitting up the Corinthian girls I don't know yeah like lawfully I think I the mean, Corinthian girls are legal <laughs> uh, I think that would be yeah, too. like I mean if it is like my immediate read on it is like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. If you're going to indulge your passions, do it. But, you know, don't go out and rape people. I'm like, yeah, thanks, Captain Obvious. I would have thought that this was not even you said. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe that wasn't obvious back then. Um, because... <laughs> yeah, don't go well, hit that dark saying, web. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, if you, they're always like invading other things. They, they seem to have a different standard when they were going in like uh, going to war against some other neighbor, right? Because they'd enslave their neighbors and do whatever. So I don't know. Maybe it was like, maybe that is what he's talking about. Maybe. I don't know. (laughs) Maybe you can't, you know, tap at someone else's slave. Maybe it has to be your own (laughs) slave or something like that. (laughs) Bad form. Yeah. Yeah, It's bad form to tap someone else's slave. Yeah. Cloudcom doesn't like to do that. Epictetus says, don't be rapey. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <Nice. laughs> oh, God. Uh, but I love that little bit at the end there. Like, 
Um, oh, you could too, trans yeah. like a modern day one could be like he did not see my browser history, otherwise he would know what else I've done. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is good. I think it's good though. It's a perfect response. I think everyone should memorize this, and and rather than getting upset when they hear someone's talking shit, just say this. You know, if only you knew how bad I really was. If that's the yeah. worst he's got on me, that's nothing. That's basically what he's saying. Oh, totally. Uh, but assuming uh, because you're uh, living the Socratic life, right, that uh, you don't do anything wrong anyway. I actually <laughs> use a similar thing because I do go to church that, and no one at work does. And um, mm. when they give me a hard time about something, I'll just say, you don't think it's good people that need to go to church, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's bad people that need to go to church. <laughs> that always gets a laugh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, you know, I thought it was a, an interesting thing they, um, that he's raising then because, it, you know, when you think about the, the times in sort of uh, ancient Greece or ancient Rome, um, it seemed like a fairly hedonistic sort of time. Um, so I just thought it was interesting that he's sort of talking about sort of, uh, well, chastity or at least sort of, you know, sticking to a fairly moral conduct as far as uh, um, sexual relations go or whatever else it may well be. And, you know, keeping it to yourself and just not talking smack about it or rubbing anyone else's face in like uh, what a good moral person you are. And mm. it, just, it just seemed an interesting kind of concept for the time, actually. But I'm sure there was some um, religious like gods and goddesses that were about not not uh, tapping the nookie though like i'm pretty sure there was chastity gods maybe but i mean well, the gods used to get up like the greek gods were getting up to all kinds of mischief all the time so uh oh yeah zeus was a fiend <laughs> what were you gonna say Rubes? oh i had two thoughts on it i can't remember what they were um oh first of all i think it just sort of points to this he's when he's talking about chastity and not going overboard um I think it just points to a kind of like an almost like a universal truth. Like, I mean, everyone sort of knows if you go overboard and go nuts and indulge all your desires as much as you want, it's not going to end well. Like everyone knows that, whether it's alcohol or sex, everyone knows that. Uh, or VR. You know, going, <laughs> yeah, or whatever it might be. Like everyone knows too much, you know, too much of a good thing is bad for you. And I, I just yeah. probably, I think it's probably just, I think they've, everyone's known that. They've always known that. And he's just pointed it out way back then. And it's no different than it is now in that sense. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the other thought I had was, um, I think there is a school of thought back then. Um, like, I don't know whether this is what Epictetus was thinking, but um, that, you know, if, if, if you if all life boils down to is pleasure hmm. um then overloading yourself on pleasure is a bad idea you'd be better off uh moderating your intake and your pleasure so that you can even it out over a longer period of time and, and have a better overall life because if you just if you overload like if you like drink if you overload on the drink you get drunk you get sick you're gonna die early so there's actually a word for it but i can't think of what it is um, yeah, maybe it'll come to me, but it, it's basically, uh, pleasure, pleasure by moderation is the way to live is more or less what that school like temperance? was. Yeah. Temperance, but, um, that's actually a word for that. It doesn't matter what will come to me, but that was the two things I thought about reading that bit. No, that, look, that makes tons of sense. And, um, well, actually I remember, um, it was towards the end of the Republic they were talking about, um, all those sort of like pursuit of pleasures and things like that. And what a sort of poison chalice it is really. Um, yeah. Pe people get uh, too obsessed with it and that sort of colors, whatever else they're trying to do in their life. And um, um, you know, if they, if they're indulging too much, that is, and yeah. you know, putting those p pursuits ahead of other things. So yeah, that makes some sense. Well, you mentioned VR before. So the next section is uh, is not necessary for the most part to go to the games, <laughs> but if you should have occasion to go, show that your first concern is for yourself, that is, wish that only to happen which does happen, and him only to win who does win, for so you will suffer no hindrance. But refrain entirely from applause or ridicule or prolonged excitement, 
and when you go away do not talk much of what happened there except so far as it tends to your improvement for to talk about it implies that the spectacle excited your wonder yeah now i I've, I've recently experienced this so um for those of you who care about the nba game one nba final score who have not yet seen or heard the results um fast forward a minute um Ruben Lachlan, do either of you care about this? No, go for it. Ruben, all good? Oh, I didn't even know that. I don't even know they're up to the finals. Who's in it? Boston versus Golden State. Oh, I don't care then. Okay, so <laughs> that's exactly how I feel because, <laughs> um, because the team I go for isn't there. And so I was watching yeah, right. the game uh, one and. Uh, it was a totally different feel to watch that finals because I'm like, ah, oh, that's an interesting outcome of events. So at the end of the third quarter, uh, I think Golden State were up by 10 to 15. And then in the fourth quarter, Boston just caught fire. They hit uh, seven out of seven threes and ended up winning by 15 at mm. Golden State, against Golden State. And I was like, that's impressive. Oh, that's, game one. That's not Yippee. bad. Um, but at no point did I get anxious about who was going to win. I was just observing and going wow that's interesting what a uh, what a great comeback by that team that I don't care about <laughs> yeah <laughs> so this is what Epictetus is uh, uh, um, recommending is that, is that I think it? he's saying if you have to watch the game just like do that just just observe and go well whoever wins wins and oh that was interesting life goes do on do you reckon you control right yeah do you reckon though that this is just um and it's funny because i'm not even on this side but do you think it's elitist and that he's just sort of this is that whole sort of jocks versus the nerds kind of thing because uh, <laughs> he's a slave uh, kid with a bum leg yeah 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 and he's like yeah <laughs> lower yourself to the to oh, get into the it sports. depends it Come depends on. what he, i guess you can verify that by how does he feel about debates between philosophers and sophists <laughs> yeah <laughs> does he get excited and passionate watching that happen or not you know i reckon he would yeah well, maybe <laughs> we'd have to ask him can't <laughs> yeah but uh yeah no i think um i, I reckon that's some of it though but uh, but it's also it's just kind of like um i think stuff that he's saying that has no meaning so why yeah. get worked up about something that's not actually important for anything other than just entertainment for the sake of entertainment? Um, yeah, we sort of saw that earlier tonight when he's talking about what should you talk about? And he's sort of like, you know, if you're just talking about sports, maybe try to steer the conversation to something more meaningful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, oh well, here one. we go. Here we go. The next one kind of addresses this chain of thought here welcome so here we go do not go lightly or casually to hear lectures but if you do go maintain your gravity and dignity and do not make yourself offensive when you're going to meet anyone and particularly some men of reputed eminence set before your mind the thought what would socrates or zeno have done and you will not fail to make proper use of the occasion so it looks like he's consistent even when it's the nord nerd fest so is this the approach we need to use when we go see jordan peterson later this year we need to walk into that room and go how would socrates behave at this jordan peterson like no way bro i'm gonna walk in there i'm gonna tear his ideas apart <laughs> <laughs> well so you, you're saying it's it's jordan thrasymachus peterson is that what you're saying? <laughs> no i think i'd be thrasymachus marcus in that situation <laughs> You might be right. <laughs> no, I joke. Yeah. I just, uh, I, I had to oh. chuckle though. Uh, do not make yourself offensive though. Like, but, but I think that's like, obviously the level of excitement that he's probably feeling. And he's like, I actually have to contain my enthusiasm for ripping hard on these sophists. So, um, <laughs> Well, oh, that's a that's, t-shirt that's there. The Rip hard on a sophist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think that's, isn't that what he's talking about when he says, uh, oh, I don't know about who the Zeno cat is, but when he's like, what would Socrates have done? And you know, his whole thing was, I don't know anything. 
mm. just question, question, assume, basically assume that they know something you don't and question them yeah. to figure out, you know, do they, do they really know what's going on? Yeah. So what is a woman? Basically that strategy. Oh, I haven't seen that yet. Yeah, I haven't yet either. So I don't know. I, I don't. I can't answer that question. I haven't seen the doco. We'll have to watch it. <laughs> yeah, that'd be interesting. <laughs> no, I'm looking forward to that Pearson talk. By the way, um, I have no idea what oh, yeah, to talk about. It'll probably be like a million things. Yeah, <laughs> he seems to be. Uh, I've been listening to a few of his podcasts um, lately, and. Um, yeah, he seems to sort of jump around like whatever's kind of hitting his brain cells at that moment. So it just depends on what's on, on where he's up to at that particular time. It wouldn't matter what the topic of the thing was. Like, it seems like when his headspace is in a particular frame, like that's what he's talking about, no matter what, you know? Yeah, yeah cool. he is a bit ADHD, which being ADHD, I enjoy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he's, he's very much like, oh, rabbit hole, rabbit hole, rabbit hole. <laughs> Rabbit yeah. hole, rabbit hole, rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. But he still gets yeah, the Yeah, because I heard him, um, who was he talking to? Is that uh, well-known atheist scientist? Um, Sam Harris? No. Um, Dawkins? Richard Dawkins? It was Dawkins, yeah. There you go. And he's, he's chatting with him, <clears throat> and Dawkins was going, can you stop for a minute? Like, you're talking here, then you're talking there, then you're talking here, like... Can you just focus? Let's talk about one thing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think Dawkins can follow. I just think he doesn't want to follow. I think he wants to control the conversation and where it goes. Oh, they, they actually had quite a measured conversation. And I, I think just, mm. uh, Edison just said, oh, we've just got different ways of thinking. This, this is how I think, and this is how you think. So that's how it is. Let's chat. <laughs> I haven't listened to that one yet. Yeah, I need to um, invest. I did hear him have the, I think it was three or four debates with Sam Harris that was hosted by, um, uh, not Dave Rubin, what was the other dude? He just did a book actually, and he did um, that other book called The Strange Death, Douglas Murray. Yeah, he was good. Mm. Anyway, let's get back to topic. Let's not chuck a Peterson and go down some rabbit holes. <laughs> well the next next one's still appropriate anyway so keep going okay when you go to visit some great man prepare your mind by thinking that you will not find him in and that you will be shut out that the doors will be slammed in your face that he will pay no heed to you and if in spite of all this you find it fitting for you to go go and bear what happens and never say to yourself it was not worth all this for that shows a vulgar mind and one at odds with outward things. This is good, this one. I, You know how people say never meet your heroes? Yeah. I think it's because they're not prepared like this. And I did meet Jordan Peterson one-on-one -on -one and I went prepared. I had a plan of, I'm going to say who I am and I'm going to talk about this thing and... But that was my objective. My objective had nothing to do with how he reacted or what he would say. It was just, mm. I would like to meet that person, shake their hand and say this one thing. And then whatever they have to say to me is a bonus. And um, that experience yeah. was awesome. One of, the, one of the best experiences I've ever had in my life. And I think it's because I had the approach like this where I wasn't expecting to get anything. It was. I went there. I with wonder the if you'd feel the same way. He's he did shut you out though, or shut you down. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. But um, like you probably go, maybe he's not the guy who I think he is. If you had that experience, but yeah, um, I don't know. Like I, I was very comfortable if if all I got was just a handshake and thanks, then that was going to be enough. Yeah. So. No, look, I think you're right. I'm just. Uh, well, I've met I other think. celebrities before. I've met um, some pretty famous rugby league players and some you know, other celebrities like the Top Gear people. I've met a couple of those at the Top Gear thing years ago. And yeah, met a few. 
Mm. Um, but I just every time I've not expected anything from them, so I haven't been disappointed to get nothing. Sure. Yeah. So I think this is right. What do you What do you guys think? I, I tend to agree. Um, yeah, it's just funny how he describes it as, uh, you know, it, it was not worth all this for that shows a vulgar mind and one at odds with outward things. And I was just kind of thinking on that bit a bit more. Well, because it's not um, in your control how they react. Sure, sure. But it just seemed like quite strong language, right? It's a it's vulgar. vulgar. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder why that choice of words. But that's interesting. I don't know why. Hmm. Have either of you met your heroes or, or anyone that you're like, I need to meet this person? Not really. Not really. No, I haven't. I, I've never really thought about it. Why would you meet if you could meet one person? Oh, I've already met Peterson. That was a big one for me. Um, yeah. Growing up, I always wanted to meet Michael Jordan, but as I've gotten older, I've decided I don't want to meet him. Um, and and I think the documentary about him really showed that he's not good at relationships because he, he is so competitive. I, I don't think he would be that great to meet. I think he'd be a bit of an <laughs> arrogant person, maybe, or difficult person. Um, yeah. How about you, Locker? Uh, no one really sort of comes to mind, but um, I don't know. But whenever I sort of think of something like this, I suppose, <clears throat> you know, just talking to somebody who, like, well, say they may be famous or something like that, I always just think that I'd be um, happy to talk about something fairly um normal with them rather rather than sort of any like sort of big questions or anything like that just to um yeah have some regular conversation and in some ways i think that'd be just kind of like seeing the measure of the person if you know what i mean if they can just have a normal conversation with you mm. um rather than sort of being on if you know what i mean i have met two people who are in the top 100 wealthiest australians list and um, mm -hmm. both times I've just treated them like any other person and got to know them a little bit, ask about their family yeah. and, you know, what their hobbies are and just try and get some communication going. And both times they've been actually pretty nice people. And I think for them it's a bit refreshing that I'm treating them in that way and not wanting things or yeah. not intimidated by the fact that they're wealthy because I don't care. Like, you can be a very, very wealthy, unhappy person. Oh, absolutely. So, for sure, for sure. How about you, I, um, uh, I met Gladys Berejiklian once, um, and my only thought was she's very tiny and she has cold hands. Maybe she needs <laughs> a jumper. <laughs> but um, no, that was that's quite literally what happened. And uh, but, I mean, that's not a criticism. I, a I, lot of I, people I... look tiny to me. I was very close yeah. to her once, and I met the police that were in the cover at the time. <laughs> I seem to remember that. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> um, as for meeting, if there's anyone I wanted to meet, it'd, it'd probably be a couple of people I'd like to meet, but I think the problem is I would want to meet them for a specific reason and ask them a specific question. And mm. I think I know that being someone that they've never met before, that probably wouldn't be acceptable, so... I guess for me, I'm like, if I want to meet someone, it's because I want to have like a, I want to get some information from, or have like a, a proper personal interaction, which is just not really realistic. So for me, I, I don't really have any real interest in meeting anyone in particular, because I know that that's kind of not, I'm not going to get out of that interaction what I would really be looking for. Hmm. Like there'd be certain like directors of movies or authors of books that I'd want to meet because I'd be, I want to be like, yeah, but what about this bit? So what did you mean then? Why did you do that? Yeah. And I just yeah. know, I know in my mind for somebody who's like, you know, acting at that level, they're going to be like, who is this idiot? And, you know, is he going to, is he going to grind my bones to make my bread, make his bread or something? You know, like, 
But I reckon, um, you know, those guys would um, get hammered with questions like that all the time. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know. Because um, it's like you always see people there talk about if they do like the convention circuit or something like that, if they're like associated with like, let's say Star Wars or something, some popular franchise. And, they get uh, that all the time. Like, yeah, that's every, true. Everywhere it goes, people will be like, so, you know, what's happening? <laughs> you know, fill, fill in the gaps here for me, you know. Be like, oh, come on, you know. <laughs> Same question I, every um, time. No, I just, I just know that I, I, I just know they think I'm a weirdo because, like, one comes to mind. I'd want to meet the Coen Brothers, and my first question would be like, "So, after watching No Country for Old Men, do you believe that there's a God?" <laughs> and they'd be like, "Is this guy about? To, is this guy about to hit me with a Bible or something?" I'd be like, no, no, not at all. I just legitimately want to know what you're trying to say with that film. And they'd be just like, "Oh, it's another one of these weirdos." <laughs> I haven't watched that movie for a long time, actually. I don't know if I've seen it. I don't think I have. I just remember at the time going, wow, that's such a weird movie. Yeah, I've seen it a bunch of times. I love it. But yeah, it's, yeah. it's weird. I'll have to watch it with you, Ruben, because I don't think I've seen it. Yeah, It's cool. different. It's real different. Mm. All right, let's continue. If my iPad ever unlocks. Oh, this is very um, Socrates, by the way. This is a first gen iPad mini. And the case is still the original case I bought. And it's that run down that I've actually sealed it all with duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I still choose on your hippie. I still use it, it still works. <laughs> all I use it for is Kindle, so it's all good. Very good. Are you, are right. you just taking what uh, you barely need? And require correct a man always needs duct tape <laughs> <laughs> uh okay here we go in your conversation avoid frequent and disproportionate mention of your own doings or adventures for other people do not take the same pleasure in hearing what has happened to you as you take in recounting your adventures in other words <laughs> shut up you have two ears and one mouth <laughs> I reckon this is good and um, yep. I feel like I, I could be wrong here but I, I've tried in the past to operate off this principle right if you treat conversation as a game and the object of the game is get the other person to say more than you mm. so that's actually what I do when I, I, I meet someone and I don't really know what I'm going to talk about I try to I just try, in my head I just try to play that game and it really it actually really works if you can manage to get someone to tell you more about them than you say about yourself. Not only are you learning something, but you find that a lot of people go, oh, wow, that guy, he really seems interested, which I may or may not be, but that's just how I play that. I, 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 I quite literally no, play one. that game. <laughs> yeah, that's, right. that's funny. <laughs> I, I remember listening to an a interview with Trump and it came out about conversations and he's like, every conversation has a winner and a loser. So my objective in every conversation is to be the winner. <laughs> I'm like, wow, well, what a knob. But uh, <laughs> it's um, it's funny. I haven't thought of it like that, Ruben. I think I I learned a long time ago like to ask questions and get it gets people to open up. And then once they open up, they feel more comfortable. And I always try and remember at least one personal thing about each person. So the next time I meet them, I'll follow up. Like, oh, how's hockey going? Or um, how's your boat going? It's something I think I picked up when I first started selling air conditioning systems like 15 years ago. I'd walk into people's homes and just look at their photos on the wall and just look for something in the room that gave away what their interest was. And then I just asked them about it, like, oh, I've noticed you've got a photo of boats. Like, do you like boating? And they're like, oh, yeah. Like, and oh, yeah, my, my pop had a boat. He said, I've got on boats, you know. And so they're like, oh, cool, you get it. And then you just start talking about boats. And half an hour later, mm -hmm. you'd be like, oh, by the way, this is your quote for the air con. You're keen. And they're like, yeah, yeah, man. Like, because <laughs> <laughs> you just, they feel like they know you because they've been talking about something they care about for half mm -hmm. an hour rather than just watching you measure up a room and go, oh, you need this size air con. So. Yeah, it worked really well. 
How about you, Lachlan? You're a natural conversationalist. I'm really not, actually. What do you come across as one? Um, yeah, people tell me that. It's uh, <laughs> interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I wish I was uh, better at doing uh, Rubes's game, I reckon. And um, I'm going to I'm going to give that a go because um, I reckon that's a that's a good thing. I like it. I like the idea a lot. Mm. Um, <laughs> but look, I, I understand what he's sort of talking about here because it's super frustrating, and I know someone else who um i don't know maybe it's not quite the same thing but it's like you know whenever you sort of have you tell some story some anecdote they always tell you back the same story plus one but whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. and uh yeah, i know someone i can do that with and it's like you talk about four things and it'll be the same four things just get repeated back to you you know <laughs> which is <laughs> which is hilarious but uh I think maybe the technique is to let them talk before uh, before I do. I think is the thing. So, so maybe that's right. And then you can one up them, and then you can win. <laughs> that's right. So can, what you've can... done is you've taken Ruben and Trump's strategies and put them together. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It'd be a sweet day. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. All right, uh, let's go to the next one. Avoid raising men's laughter for it is a habit that easily slips into vulgarity and it may well suffice to lessen your neighbor's respect. I'm guilty of this. I do love getting a laugh. I get a laugh as often as possible in every conversation, <laughs> uh, particularly at work. <laughs> must, must be all that uh, lewd humor that's uh, you know uh, gonna lessen your neighbor's respect, Tim. Well, but I'm also good at dad jokes, right? Because I've been a dad for yeah. 13 years now and um, like there's one I'm particularly proud of at work. We were talking about damages to food. This is a while ago. And they got a list of all the different products that kept getting damaged. And the branch manager at that time, his name was David. Um, he goes, all right, let's look at the most damaged product. And um, they got it out and uh, it was yogurt. And he goes, why is this happening to everyone around the table? I said, I know why it's happening. It's a completely straight face. And he goes, oh, why? And I'm like, you have a problem with culture. Uh, nice. <laughs> I, knew, I mean, oh, I knew you were going there. Boom. I, I still enjoyed it, Tim. And it was a room full of <laughs> laughter and disgust by David, who then laughed after his initial fury, then saw this funny side and laughed. So that's the sort of laugh I go for. <laughs> but they, occasionally they do slip into vulgarity. And <laughs> so, yes, this is true. This is a very true reading. Yeah, he's, he's, he's just saying, don't be the class clown. See, this is hard though, because in storytelling, the jester, the courtroom jester, speaks the truth, and he is the beginning of wisdom. It's it's consistent in most mythology that has the king is the jester, and the jester talks the truth, and it was even in the Northmen, this idea. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. So, there's wisdom in being the clown. Well, and, and look, I guess uh, that's why, I mean, there's been a lot of stuff in the papers about people getting pissed off with comedians. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, you're right. So, um, I don't know. So, often joking about sensitive things, but maybe true, true but obviously, uh, you know, twisted for a humorous angle or whatever it may well be, but well, it's it might a, be onto something there, Tim. It's a classic indicator of tyranny is when the court can no longer tolerate a jester. Mm. It means the the kingship has become tyrannical. And so something I actually posted a month or two ago, one of my friends was saying that some joke that I think it might have been Dave Chappelle or someone else said was too offensive. And I was yep. like, no. And they're like, they should shut him up. And I'm like, no, you can never shut up the jester. If you, if you demand that someone cannot speak and it's a joke, then you become a tyrant. Mm. And I believe that. I think that's right. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting because, um, yeah, I mean, you're getting down to sort of freedom of speech and stuff, and that does seem to be something that's um, under more threat. Oh, yeah. And, um, just with um, cancel culture and um, I think, uh, you know, 
the voices of few people outweighing the voices of many just because it can be amplified through social media and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's something, it's something I pointed out to my son the other day was because there's something he got exposed to online that I found quite offensive and um, I was, I was pretty angry about it at the time and he's like you look really angry and I'm like well I am angry because if if a physical person had said these things in your presence or handed you this material I would be in their face <laughs> and, and, and probably hurting their face but because it's some unknown person that I can't see there's no outlet for that and I think that's part of the problem with online is it's just far less consequence for people doing things that aren't generally accepted as morally good mm. like there's a le- uh, what's the word? there's a lot less risk for these people to put to do things that the majority of people think are wrong yeah and, I, and while I like I support freedom of speech 100% there's still a place for choice or particularly when it comes to what your children are exposed to yeah I guess that's just up to us as parents as much as we can control what they have access to at the mm. time but um, it's just a lot um, harder than it used to be man like me growing no, up for sure. playing for sure. games and stuff having dial up access yeah you know the, the availability for things to go wrong now for what mm. the kids can access is just so much faster and so much easier and there's so many more people who are aware of how to use that technology that there was when dial-up internet was a thing. It's just, it's pretty bad. You, yeah. you have to be very, very on it to make sure that things don't go wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. No. That's fair. That would be a good show, actually, for us to talk about how, how do you, like, control the access that your kids have and, you know, have you experienced any applications where things have gone wrong or where you've caught something that shouldn't have been going on going on and how you've responded that would be interesting Hmm. all right we're up to the last one for this section and then i think we'll call it a night because although we've only done two sections there's been a lot yeah uh it is dangerous to sorry it is dangerous to to lapse into foul language when anything of the kind occurs, rebuke the offender, if the occasion allow, and if not, make it plain to him by your silence, or a blush, or a frown, that you are angry at his words. I love the idea that you'd be blushing, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what would make me blush. It's, uh, I've got a pretty good poker face. Yeah. I, uh... Yeah, I don't know. It's um, again, I think just reflecting on that sort of modesty sort of angle. Hey, like um, there's just no need for it. So um, you know, stick to your own moral code. And if it's interesting that they're they're sort of saying you know to um, sort of I don't know, shame them a little bit for it. Um, whereas what was that other example we were talking about just before? Uh, that was more about your um. Uh, chasteness or whatever it may well be mm. and not rubbing other people's faces in it but then in this case he's sort of say no shame them shame them for their language <laughs> shame uh, so ding, ding, ding. <laughs> <laughs> actually I wonder what passed for um... oh sorry I was just going to say oh. Lock, you're actually good at this you use the word dang and dang it a lot and um, yep. often when you say it it, just, it makes me think of Ned Flanders for some reason but <laughs> you're, you're actually really good at not cursing. <laughs> so that out there. That's impressive. Well, Do you know what? That, that, that's actually um, because my father never swore, ever. Hmm. And um, so that's the example I had growing up. And uh, obviously it's a bit different when, you, when you're older, but he never swore. I cannot remember him ever swearing. Not once. There you go. That's cool. Yeah. So, so hence the Flanders. Um... 
although, although mum used to drop one every now and then. But, oh, uh, I remember dad mum, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, nice. Sorry, you were saying yeah. before. Oh, I just, I just want to know what uh, what qualifies as foul language in ancient Greece. Uh, chicken and rooster. <laughs> oh, nice ah. one. There's, there's the dad joke. There's the dad joke. <laughs> yeah, right. I wonder what that is. Hmm. Oh, I just want to know some ancient Greek square words. That's all. I literally meant I want to know what qualifies as foul language. Oh, would, Malacca would be one. <laughs> <laughs> That's in uh, <laughs> the Assassin's Creed Origin game about 5,000 times. Yeah. Every two seconds. Yeah. Pretty much. It's a comma. <laughs> Actually, yeah, I, wonder, yeah. I wonder if I could... I wonder if you... You know you can program a key to change its what it puts on the screen. I'm wondering if I could change yeah. my comma to say that instead <laughs> yeah, just be the full stop yeah Malacca how, how would you like your coffee Malacca <laughs> like some sugar in it Malacca exactly <laughs> uh, alright well uh, let's uh, let's head on down to our favourite pub because it's that time I hope that can work well. Top up my glass just slightly with a little bit more of that tea, but not too much. Just have to work tomorrow. Mm. <laughs> All right. So, topic for the what, pub for what, lots of us. What's your, yeah. What's your question? What's your question for the pub? Well, I haven't actually got one pre-prepared, um, but I did want to talk about. So, I put out the offer to you guys that we'll take our kids to the drags on a Wednesday night so for those of think that's like um, people show up in their street cars to a racetrack which is local to us and then they do racing um, fully legal all good safe there's proper racetrack it's all that sort of stuff so it's all good um, now is this the equivalent of gladiators and and follow up question does taking your kids and, and all of us have sons taking your kids to the drags increase the likelihood that they'll be hoonigans um, when they hit their pee plates so are we actually doing a disservice by getting them into going fast in cars I've actually thought about that before and um, uh, yeah I, I worry that that uh, that may be exactly <laughs> what i'm doing <laughs> yeah Pl planting the wrong seed yeah um so i have actually given that a little bit of thought and uh i don't know I, I, i'm probably going to um enroll them in some like proper like advanced driver training and stuff when um yeah when we sort of get around to getting their peas. I, I didn't do anything like that i know when i got my my pea plates and sorry it's provisional license for everyone in countries other than Australia. And um, I was a pretty terrible driver when I got my P's. Um, just lacking confidence. And then, you know, if you're not confident when you're on the road, that's when you make mistakes when you're driving. Yeah. Or conversely, if you're overconfident, that's also when you make mistakes when you're driving. Um, but, um, but yeah, no, I, th I think I need to, to do some of that if you look at countries like some of the places in Scandinavia, they do a lot of that sort of stuff with their um, their young drivers. They've got quite good, you know, driving standards over there as a consequence, I think. Um, yeah, I think it's the psychology of the course too. I recall reading something about if you call it an advanced driving course, they tend to have more accidents because then they go, oh, yeah, so I'm a freaking race car driver. But if they call it like so, a defensive driving course, then yeah, yeah, yeah. they tend yeah. to do better. Yeah. It's interesting. It's the same things they're being taught. It's just the attitude that they have behind it when they leave the place. Yeah. yeah like yeah, changing yeah, that totally. one word. Changing yeah. that one word you were talking about at the start. Yeah. Mm. Mm. What do you think, Rubes? Like, Because I know your boys aren't really petrol heads by any means. Yeah. Do you think it's... Um, do you ever think like if I take them to these things, that's going to maybe get them to 
do some silly things when they're older or you haven't really thought about it? I haven't really thought about it. Um, maybe I'm too optimistic, but I just think they're going to be smart enough to know the difference between what's happening out there and what they do themselves. But maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't know. I'll have to give that some thought. I, I distinctly remember going in your parents' old red van with your older brother driving and turning right onto some street with five or six of us in this van and somehow your brother got one of the uh, inside rear wheel to like <laughs> do a little burn out as we were turning right on some street. It was uh, horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> you know what though? Like I, I think some of it does <clears throat> happen in isolation though anyway um, where it's just like sort of Maybe not for everybody, but I don't know. Like I remember trying to do a burnout for the first time and not because anyone, like no one was there. And uh, it was in um, in the company ute, Tim, you might remember. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Hilux. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, just because I wanted to try that, right? And uh, there's no one around and so I'm going to give that a go. Yeah, no harm caused, but uh, I'm sure, like, yeah, I, like certain kids do that anyway, right? They're just gonna try and oh, find, yeah. hopefully, hopefully, do it in a safe environment or whatever. I did it in a fairly safe environment, but I wouldn't have done it around people. But uh, but other than that, I'm gonna stick my kids in a penalty box. So um, some slow ass, gutless hatchback. <laughs> I, I got a penalty box as my first car. It was a yeah. short wheelbase Nissan Patrol non-turbo diesel four-speed manual. I remember that and, car. Uh, gosh, it was slow. I still managed to get <laughs> airborne on speed humps, so. though. <laughs> Stupid things they used to do. I can still smell the fish oil. Oh, yeah. Had to stop it from rusting. <laughs> Those Japanese cars from the 80s, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> did you hoon much Ruben you used to have a you had two Tiranas you had a you had the supercharged V6 Statesman did you ever hoon in them or yeah. you just cruised oh well, I had to learn in a red high ace which I mean it was gutless but having said that they were pretty dicey things to drive like there was no oh, weight yeah. in the rear end and yeah. it was it was a rear wheel drive was it, a it was drive? yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. They would have had pretty um Which, skinny, yeah, that I, tires on them too from memory, the old high aces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they were rubbish. But um yeah, I think about it, that'd be probably a fun little thing to drive, but um <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit older, but um no, I, I yeah, I did a little bit of hooning, but um I was I'm always pretty a pretty defensive driver. Oh. I'm not I've never really been a big speedhead. I don't know why, I just it's not my thing. Mm. Oh shocking. The first week I had my first V eight I picked up my wife's two younger brothers and we went into the industrial area around Auburn and I just found it's top speed. <laughs> it's just like, this is fine, a long road. We'll go up it, make sure there's no cops or people there and then we're just going to put this in the floor and see what it's got. And um, yeah, that was stupid. <laughs> I look back at that yeah, and I'm I, like, holy crap, how did I not hurt myself? I'm not saying I didn't do stupid things, but it might also be because my first job without, like my first proper job without going into it, I was pretty young. And it was the kind of job where if I lost my license, I'd probably lose my job. So maybe yeah. that tempered my uh, tempered my behaviour a little bit. Yeah, I think you're right. <clears throat> Lachlan, your yeah. first car um, was a Golf, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. I used to drive that around with no rego as well. Ooh. Oh. In fact, in fact, I didn't have my license and the car wasn't registered. <laughs> wow. <laughs> was that just so you could learn? Yeah, it's. I, I used to with a, a a mate of mine, and we just go and just do laps around the block, just more or less sort of practicing driving. But it, it sort of did start to get a little bit quicker and a little bit quicker, and it, I had to <laughs> I had to stop because um, you know I was actually more worried my mate was going to smash my car into something or someone, right. and. Um, um, you um, it's all right, mate. There's a six month statute of limitation on the. Uh, <laughs> it's a long time ago. <laughs> it's a long ago. You're all clear. Only six months. That's mad. 
I could tell so many stories. <laughs> <laughs> like Bengal, Bengal Bypass to where I live in 15 minutes. <laughs> that's the, so for those listening at home, that's uh, what would that be in kilometers? About 30 kilometers in 15 minutes. Yeah, <laughs> that's not a that's not a straight road either. No, it was not. It, <laughs> that was in my old convertible V8. I miss that car. <laughs> well, um, that was a good chat, fellas. Mm. So, um, yeah, for those of those uh, of you listening, thank you for joining us. Um, like all things, the Republic wasn't built in a day, and neither are middle-aged men. And uh, we will hopefully see you guys next week. So thank you for joining us tonight, gentlemen. As always, it's great fun. See you in a week. Right. Catch us later. <laughs> Bye. Catch you later, guys.